Okay, friends, just waiting to see that we're live on YouTube. And we get this cool little buzzer. It says, we are live. Welcome back to another session. It's Mike and Deanna. We are here to answer some of your questions just to catch up with you. We'd love to catch up with you on Wednesdays because every Wednesday at 5 p.m. we have our members call. And today we're going to talk about OMAD at 5 p.m. We'd love to have you as part of that. But today it's going to just going to be a free Q&A. We're going to dive into fe feeding patterns. You know, I think this was funny. I shared a post on Instagram just yesterday, and it was about time-restricted feeding. A new study had emerged last fall in animals, in mice. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people didn't realize that under this intermittent fasting umbrella, there's many different subtypes of fasting, ranging from something that Deanna does a lot, uh, one meal a day OMAD. What I try to do is like two meals a day, but I try to be more of a, in a compressed feeding window, like a time restricted feeding window. And a lot of people, isn't it interesting, didn't know, I mean, it's fine, it's totally fine, but they didn't realize that a subset of intermittent fasting is time restricted feeding. Mm. So there's different ways to go about this. And so this is what you do, Deanna. Yes. Deanna for what inspired you to get into eating one meal a day? I can't remember, was it a podcast interview? Was it serendipitous? Like what? No, actually, it was kind of a big deal. <clears throat> My mom was diagnosed with cancer. And so, I was just uh, reading more about autophagy and how I could prevent personally uh, getting cancer because it runs in my family. Mm -hmm. That was it. So I just uh, cold turkey did it and woke up one day. I'm like, I'm going to do this. And one meal meaning like within a two hour period. So there's other, you know, subsets with OMAD as well, right? So I try to do it within a two hour uh, window. So. So you have all your meals, all the nutrition. Now, you're having amino acids during the day. So we're going to talk about branch chain amino acids during training. I think that's a kind of an important thing because a lot of people are kind of scared of that because we know that, we've talked about this on the channel many times, we know that autophagy can be inhibited through mTOR activation. And we know some of the benefits associated with taking branch chain amino acids are stimulating mTOR therefore improving or upregulating muscle protein synthesis. So it seems kind of counterintuitive, you know, why you would want to take branch chain amino acids. And I know why Deanna is doing it. We're going to explain that. Maybe let's just dive into that now because, you know, yeah. and actually uh, I got a great message from one of our Myoscience customers today about the BCAs. I'll share with you in a minute. But oh, nice. um, <laughs> so you were training... I want to talk about the transition, but since we're on amino acids, so you but now it's been a, a few weeks since you've been taking the aminos. What have you yes. noticed like during the workout? Even better gains. So I was getting significant gains um, after going all mad. And again, there was a transition period, which I talk about in the ebook that I have. Um, but I had significant muscle gains, and then including the BCAAs, I felt like just more full. And so I'm not sure what the correlation is there. Can you define more of full? That. Just like my muscles had more, um, I just looked more like full, but still lean, still very vascular. You're talking, I noticed it's out of, it's out of focus. Keep Are we going. out of focus? Oh my gosh. So yeah, um, I do two scoops of, of the uh, branched chain amino acids, uh, inter-workout. And again, you know, I'm working out pretty hard. So I'm, I'm working out for like an hour resistance training. And this is after I've done fasted movement in the morning. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Just, I've, I've just noticed better gains, which is the goal here is we want to build muscle, right? You, um, with intermittent fasting, the goal is not to like lose muscle weight. You want to just burn fat and simultaneously build muscle at the same time, lean muscle. So exactly. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so amino acids can help you. And so I think this is one, one thing that we want to emphasize when we talk about these in our member courses and everything like this guys is there's many ways to go about doing any given one thing, right? So, um, OMAD for a male that weighs 300 pounds is going to be different for OMAD for a woman that weighs like you're 120 or something like that. So yeah. there's, there's many different ways to go about this. You know, if, if taking amino acids helps you during your exercise, it helps with recovery. It helps you feel fuller. Like Deanna's talking to meaning you your muscle bellies seem to be a little bit more enlarged, right. then go ahead and go and, and do that. You know, a lot of us get into these ruts and these, you know, we follow a guru, an expert, a, a pundit, someone, you know, they only have meat. So then they think they can only have the person following them can only do this. But there's so many different ways to go about this. So I, I, I think it's it's important to consider, you know, for example, Deanna has a three hour, two hour window kind of where you're, you start eating and then you, basically what you do is we'll talk about your meals, you know, and stuff like that. But you, ha you have a lot of protein, like over 130 grams of protein. I do. And in, in a two hour feeding, 
feeding window. And, um, you know, there's some days you guys, I mean, I'm not completely strict with the two. I mean, if I'm hungry after two, I come back from a walk after dinner, I will have a little bit more. So sometimes it can go to three, but generally it, and some days it can be like an hour. It, it's so. not three major meals. No, it's no, no, not three like, hours. So yeah, okay. yeah, it's, it's, um, basically when I say one meal, it's tough for me to say that because it's like, it's like tapas style, right? So, um, and we can get into the meals when you want, Mike, and how I do that. Um, but yeah, it's it's a lot of food. You know, you got to know how to eat and got to love to eat within a short period of time. Yeah. And she's eating a lot of protein, like north of 120 grams of protein in that short period of time. I am. I am. And I'm, uh, yeah, I'm weighing out the, the meat proteins for another book that I'm doing. So I'm actually like tracking right now um how much i'm eating and the protein that i'm ingesting and it's actually quite a bit more than um you know some people think they're eating a lot of protein but i I suggest weighing it sometimes just to see how much you're really eating especially if it's something new like a organ meat versus grass-fed lamb you know they all have different protein content Mm -hmm. so no i think that's where tracking and weighing comes in you know if you've never done that or you haven't done that in a while it's good to kind of check in because you think like Deanna thought she was having a lot of protein yeah. and then started going back to the scale, not to be dogmatic about this or religious or anything like that, but just be like, you know, how much really am I having? And like, you were realizing that you weren't having as much as you thought you were. It was it was a it was a lot, but um not as much as I thought, for sure. And um what I'm noticing with some people who are posting different meals on OMAD on Instagram is that um they're probably not getting in enough protein believe it or not, I'm looking at the plate and I'm like, wow, that's it. Like they probably need a lot more for the activity that they're doing. So, um, yeah, but again, everyone's different and, uh, yeah, the, the pulling out the kitchen scale and getting rid of the bathroom scale is always my, my, uh, my key. But, mm. um, the goal in mind is to eyeball food eventually. So, but having, but you idea. need some sort of reference point. You do. You initially. do. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really good, good book. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's some uh, some questions here, you know, from Seth. He says, "Is your ebook primarily gear, geared towards women or men?" No, we have so many men in the course yep. um, now. A lot of doctors, a lot of personal trainers, coaches um, have been lo- loving the content because it is kind of it's new content coming from someone who is a health professional and who's fit herself and a mom that works. So it's not like right. Deanna has all day to spend in the gym or meal prep. So we're, we're all right. busy like a lot of you. Um, but th- there's some really great questions that we want to honor everyone that's here live. And as always, friends, if you're enjoying this live video, please hit that like button. Mm-hmm. That just lets us know that this content is something that we should do more often, you know, um, and it does help our channel. So if you like our channel, that like button obviously helps us because YouTube does look at the likes to dislikes ratio. Um, but a, a few questions, I think Mary Gold, thanks for being here. And she has a question about, you know, as, you're, as you age, mm-hmm. would that one meal a day work? And I have a little comment that I'm going to uh, share, pass the microphone back to Deanna. Of course, you can interrupt me at any given time. However, <laughs> it's interesting that that question comes up. So the question again, to summarize for those of you guys mm-hmm. listening and watching the replay is, as you get older, would it be more problematic to just have one meal a day? Because it's kind of like a lot of food to shove into your di- digestive system over a short period of time. Now, mm-hmm. what's interesting about this is there was a study in elderly women, women over the age of 63, I shared this with our members a few weeks ago, uh, also posted some Instagram stories about this, but long story short, the, the researchers looked at muscle protein synthesis and lean muscle mass. And what they found, contrary to what many people would think, is the women doing one meal a day, the elderly women tended to preserve more lean mass compared to women that were doing three evenly spaced meals throughout the day. Mm-hmm. So this is the important thing is, Some people may respond based upon their age and their gender and their activity level. So it's not, you know, this is where nutrition gets complicated because in in so-called like finance or real estate, in other domains, there's a lot of like black or white, right? There's not so much gray area. Mm -hmm. But in nutrition, there's a lot of gray area because we're all so different. We're at different time points in our life spectrum. And that's where we need to kind of apply context and common sense to any recommendations that we're getting, whether we're reading it, we're getting it from a coach. That's why a coach or a mentor is helpful in this instance. And so it may be based upon a few of these studies going back to the one meal a day in elderly women that for whatever reason, based upon hormones, postmenopausally and so forth, women that are elderly may do better in terms of preserving more lean muscle mass Absolutely. doing one meal a day. And I, this is something that we talk a lot about in the book. And I think it has to do with this metabolic switch, yeah. making the switch 
from glucose utilization and fat storage to fat utilization, meaning utilizing fat as a predominant fuel substrate and burning fat instead of storing it. And so that's the thing we see, particularly with women as they age and men as well, is pivoting to more fat storage, glucose utilization away from fat utilization and fat storage. And part and parcel of that metabolic switch, and Deanna will get into it now, is growth hormone and the associated hormones. And there's a ton of, I know some people in the fitness space say, oh, well, growth hormone increases with fasting, but growth hormone's not anabolic. Ask any bodybuilder who's you know, over 250 pounds that is, that is you know, transparent about their anabolic steroid use or their performance enhancing drug use, they'll tell you that growth hormone is anabolic. That's why bodybuilders use growth hormone in conjunction with insulin and other things. But um, what have you noticed, Deanna? And, you know, you're just starting to, ever like every week, it's weird. You come up to me and you're like, Mike, I'm <laughs> noticing this and I'm noticing this. And, yeah. and I'm like, I, I can't deny it. Like, because, you know, here's what's kind of funny <laughs> is I'm not necessarily a proponent of OMAD. I'm just seeing how excited you are. I've never seen you get excited about any particular thing right. in a long time like you are with this. Right. And seeing all these changes, I'm like, wow, this is crazy. I would have never, I would have thought you were nuts. Yeah. And I'm really excited, honestly, because it's going to help so many of you, honestly, from the bottom of my heart. That's why I get excited. And I cite these comments to Mike weekly because I want us to talk about these things with you. And the ebook that I have out, it's a guide, you guys. It's not going to tell you, you know, bit by bit, teaspoon by teaspoon, what to take, how to move, how to resistance train. It's not about that because again, we're all different, but I can sure as heck let you know that it's probably going to be a life changer if you're, if you don't, if you've hit a plateau and you're older or whatever, and you just don't know what to do. And so regarding the age factor, when I was uh, in my 30s, um, I didn't practice intermittent fasting, um, not until actually I have after I had Inez. And um, I played around with feeding windows, different feeding windows, anywhere between like four hour, six hour, eight hour. And they all worked and they were fine. Um, but the significant change happened when I re really greatly reduced my my uh, feeding window, and I was very reluctant. I was very reluctant. Why were you reluctant? Because you know I'm really active. You know I work out five to six days a week for real. Like it's pretty intense. Um, heavy weights for me. And uh, whoa, Siri, <laughs> chill out, man. It happens. <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> I love Siri. Anyway, um, and yeah, active job. I'm never sitting. And I thought, well, heck, worst case scenario, um, I don't feel good and I eat, right? And that's my, that's what I was thinking. I'll just do. You can always fall back on food. Right. right. So like cold turkey and I had a good background. I was pretty keto adapted. So I had a good background. I'm healthy. I don't have any autoimmune issues. So um, going into it, I wrote down and I share this in the guide, the symptoms that I had within the first four or five months. Cause you guys, it's a transition when you're socially programmed to eat multiple meals a day and just like three meals a day, it kind of gets to you. You're like, oh no, what if I don't have three meals a day? Well, let me tell you, did our ancestors do that? Probably not, you guys. It's a lot of time, it fit my lifestyle. So I was like, this is, this is gonna fit my lifestyle if I can do it. And if it works, I'm gonna definitely wholeheartedly share it with everybody. Okay, so what I can say is this, um, I'm stronger, my skin has changed, um, my brain is focused, I'm laser focused, I have a heck of a lot more productivity time, um, I think I'm just a better wife and mom in general, you know, I'm just really like present, because um, I'm not worrying about so much meal prep, you know, all day long, and I have more resilience. And that, and I'm building muscle and I'm leaner than I ever have. And I'm, I'm 40, I was like, how old am I? 43 and a half. <laughs> I'm 43 and a half. But yeah, I'm a heck of a lot healthier, I think, now than I was in my 20s and in my 30s. So it's a tool and I am loving it. I'm loving it. 
Yeah, there's, I'm just reading the comments. Anytime I look down, friends, um, uh, you know, I'm not like uh, watching the stock market or anything. I'm, I'm reading your comments and everything. I thought there's uh, so many great comments that are coming in here. Jim D in the house. Jim's always here. Comment. Jim, thanks for being here. Yeah. Um, Suzanne DU4 says, I agree with you, Mike. Uh, as, as a woman, you know, I found OMAD to be very helpful. Uh, Suzanne says she's 57 and doing OMAD and loves it, which gets to kind of a question and a, a mental roadblock. You, you see, again, nutrition is unlike a lot of different different domains where we have these biases and we hear experts talk about something so we believe it to be true. For example, one of these kind of adages that people talk about is fasting and keto is bad for female hormones. We hear that so much. And to be totally honest, it's usually coming, and I don't want to say this in a, in a derogatory way, but sometimes it's coming from from overweight people who have probably other reasons as to why their hormones are imbalanced, like right. insulin resistance, like PCOS, like maybe heavy metal exposure, persistent organic pollutant exposure, tattoos, a, a lot of different things, right? There's many different reasons why someone's hormones can become imbalanced. And every body, everyone's body is unique biochemically. OMAD's not gonna work for everyone, keto's not gonna work for everyone. Right. But, you know, that being said, if some way of feeding uh, affects your longevity in a positive way, if it, if it affects your skin health, if it affects strength and recovery, if, if it improves sleep, if it improves heart rate variability, if it improves digestion, Absolutely. like, okay, do we need to like throw all that out and say, no, it's bad for women's hormones? Right. I, you know, I think it's like we get hung up on these things and we hear about the keto diet and thyroid and Hashimoto's. I heard if you have Hashimoto's, you shouldn't do the ketogenic diet. Right. Says who? says what right. like what i mean you know and so look look i think we we just like Deanna had a lot of biases and was kind of not you know so open minded to trying a compressed feeding pattern because you were active and you're like wait i have to have protein every 2 to 3 hours and now you're doing something totally different right. you know we sometimes get in our own way in life especially when it comes to making changes like when it comes to monitoring our sleep when it comes to nutrition and fitness w would you say i mean uh, you know, Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, you know, Mike made a good point. It's like you want to take into account the science for sure, okay? These intelligent people that are giving all of us advice, whether they're vegan, vegetarian, carnivore, it's all good, good information, you guys. But what it comes down to is this your body is unique. And um, you have to learn how to experiment using these cherry picking from these different toolboxes, okay, which is what our ebook is about. And, and this is exactly what I did. So, yeah, what may work for me may not work for you. However, you have to have trust in your innate intelligence and your body. And it may not feel good at first. You may feel like, oh my God, my thyroid, I don't feel good. I'm losing hair and all this stuff. Well, yeah, you might be because it's a stress. You've been programmed to do something for years and years and years and you're making a change, but give it a chance. Don't focus so much on what like the doctors are telling you, even if they're integrative, really have trust in your body. And it, it's an art. It really is. We focus too much on what health professionals tell us, how to be, how to act, what to take, what supplements. You need to do the research. It's it's up to you. You're responsible for your body. No one knows your body better than you. Right. No doctor. In fact, in lab work is a, is a good way to triangulate, but it's not 100% perfect either, right? right. And, and so here's what's interesting too is, for example, you know, bodybuilders when they're cutting and fitness models, you know, they'll back off on their thyroid hormone, on their cytomel. They'll back off on that because it can burn muscle mass. So if you're fasting and doing keto and your thyroid goes down, maybe you shouldn't add in extra thyroid. Maybe that's an adaptive response that is favorable, not unfavorable. And I know that's like, whoa, wait, what are you talking about? Well, too much free thyroid hormone can not only, you know, help with, it, it, it can burn fat, but it's non-selective. Thyroid hormone will tear up lean muscle mass too. So these are ad 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 adaptations. The body is adaptive. It's adapting to what you do to change. And so you need to kind of think through things a little bit and trust the process and you know listen to your body and then be consistent with something so yes. look if you're going to try a compressed feeding pattern if you're going to try fasting do it don't go overboard just do something that you can manage in small little chunks right like 
if you're gonna start working out, I don't suggest working out 90 minutes every single day. It's like, look, just take 45 minutes three days a week. Get into the habit, get, and then you can increase over time. Yep. I, when I see people getting excited about fasting, they're like, I'm gonna do a 24 hour fast. At 24 hours, I feel good. I'm gonna do 36 hours. I'm gonna do 72 hours, even though I've never fasted before. It's like, okay, yeah. cowboy, I understand yeah. you're excited. That's cool. <laughs> But you're like, dude, you could then compensatory overeat. You could have refeeding syndrome. Again, the, the, it's not going to affect a lot of people, but these are theoretical possibilities that could happen. Mm -hmm. Then then you might have a, you know, so it's like, look, instead of like trying to, you know, do the Boston Marathon with no training, go slow over time and right. with the feeding patterns. And, and play, you guys, play with it. It doesn't have to be the stressful thing. In fact, don't stress about it. It's going to depend on factors such as like your your support system, your family. Um, are you an in introvert? Are you an extrovert? Believe it or not, that is a factor because we don't eat out a lot. I'm not at a day job where I have to meet people for you know food and drinks. So you have to figure out like something that works that's sustainable for you, and that could mean maybe just twice a week doing the OMAD, maybe a three hour window even. It, as long as you're cutting that that window. I mean, that's key. You guys, even if it's eight hour for you, that is key, but you know, there is a transition period. And so you, again, as Mike said, you have to trust that process. You have to trust your body through the process. So. I would like to speak. Uh, yeah, there's a David Goggins. Um, I, I was thinking about David Goggins when what he did the bad water, right? Which is a hundred. No, I think he did another race before that. Anyway, he did a hundred mile race and didn't train for it. And he realized at mile 50 that he really like made a bad decision, but he kept going. Right. So anyway, um, David Goggins hats off to him. I'm not picking on him at all, but I'm just saying like he has the mental fortitude to push through these different things. But that being said, listen, listen and trust your body. I, I had a question the other day that came in uh, on my Instagram where some lady said, gosh, I get really hungry at hour 21 of mm -hmm. fasting. Mm -hmm. I don't think fasting is good for me. And I was like, um, well, like, I don't know about you or uh, it's normal to get hungry after you have not had food for 21 hours. She right. thought it was, a, she thought that, well, well, if you fast, you should just not feel hungry. It's like, right. And you know, and a big part of this, sorry, this is just so important is that you're not, you're going to feel like crap. Okay, when you first do extended fasting, so much is gonna go through your mind. It's like when you're going on a road trip and you're listening to all those different types of music, like the country and then the rock and then the, you know, headbanging music and you go through different emotions, okay? So food is extremely emotional, very emotional. And a lot of us eat and band-aid other things, even though you don't think you have a lot going on, um, you know, we all have something, right? So what, as you not fast, me. I'm, you're I'm perfect, but not Mike. I'm so, um, when you start fasting, it's going to force you in your own little therapy session to deal with your emotions that could be causing these unhealthy cravings. Someone mentioned something about cravings for sugar, for salt, for whatever back to childhood. It's pretty crazy you guys, but it goes away. Okay. Like it's scary. And you know, a lot of people are like, oh gosh, I don't like this. I don't feel good. Um, it goes away. Your body adapts and that's where the resilience comes in. Okay. So what I heard you say is basically instead of masking emotional challenges with food, which a lot of people do, they have a shitty day, they go to McDonald's, they have a crappy day, they go to Jack in the Box, they're stressed out, they're lonely, they eat a box of ice cream. Or a keto treat. And right, whatever. So, in, <laughs> so what Deanna is saying in other words, and she said it eloquently, I'm just reinforcing it, you know, different perspective, is instead of masking your emotional challenges and emotional voids and so forth, which we all have, myself included, I was yeah, kidding, with food and junk, you have to actually freaking man up and deal with it. You have to deal with it. Which for some people, may, they may not be ready for that, yeah. right? Oh yeah, it's like self-therapy, really. I mean, Which is, yeah, and, and then knowing what hunger is, when you get that hunger, you're like, damn, that's hunger, right? So in the book, I talk about how to prepare for that because you wanna be prepared for that, okay? And that's where meal prep is extremely important. And that's where the art comes in about dining and chewing because it's not just what you eat, you guys, it's how you eat. Absolutely, 100%. So when I normally eat, I'm looking at Instagram and just kind of going like this. Is that, that's good, right? 
electronics Just off, kidding. chewing your food, dining with your friends or family, happiness, gratitude. Trying to be outside. You're going to love can. food. You know, when you're eating within a two hour period, you're just suddenly food's amazing. Tastes amazing. And having the, the awareness that there's a tendency to overeat. Oh, yeah. Because, yeah. You, you know, there's this whole psychological phenomenon. I, I might botch the jargon, the vernacular, but food scarcity syndrome. Like for example, if you have multiple siblings in the family, sometimes the younger siblings or the weaker siblings can have this food scarcity thing where they had to get food quickly. Right. And so they feel like they need to eat it really, really fast. Like we have right. two dogs and when they're both around together, they eat so fast. It's crazy. Like they don't even, they just swallow like whole chicken necks, right. lamb hearts. Like, mm. And that's another art too. So once you've mastered the fasting, okay, so you've, you've knocked down 24 hours. When you start to eat, that's another transition, knowing when to stop, okay? And that's when the app zone, is it zone? Zero. Zero, zero, whatever. So it holds you accountable. So the moment you press down, I'm done, you're done, okay? So having those things that hold you accountable, whether it be people, whether it be an app, you have to know yourself in that case because it's very easy to overeat. And I did a few times, you know, it's a transition again. I don't know, like, how am I supposed to feel? Uh Oh, is this going to last me for 22, 23 hours? I can tell you this though, after about five months of doing OMAD, I wasn't hungry. It all went away and my body just knew what to do. It knew when to stop. Now it knows when to stop. Okay. I know how to chew. I know how to breathe and just, you know, you know how to breathe? I know how to breathe when I eat. Dude. I'm not morphing down, you know, wolfing down food. Okay. You definitely want to, don't want to be breaking your fast in your car. Okay. Because your body's going to think, oh, wow. Like, did Can I Can you watch eat? Game of Thrones and break your fast? <laughs> Look, if it helps you digest food and you're watching a little bit of TV, I don't, I'm not against that. Fine. But I found just like nice, quiet conversation, chewing, um, yeah, it, it's just, it's really important how you eat that food. And, and the umami, the savory, the textures, the colors, satiety is huge with this. You want to feel that satiety and happiness. Okay. So there's a lot of like kind of foo-foo that goes along with this, but it's real. Like you want to really love the experience of eating again. And I had a patient come in the other day who she really just hated the thought of food because she felt like nothing worked. She tried everything, even the keto. And she's like, Deanna, I don't even like food anymore. And after we talked for an hour, she's like, you just enabled me to just like get excited about food again and gave me a hug. And I was like, really? I mean, 90 minutes of all that and all you want to do is like food again. And, but that's where people are these days is because there's so much crap out there. It's like, what do you do? So, um, yeah, it's just pretty crazy. You know, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Deanna's, I mean, the Instagram messages that she's getting, um, because, you know, I added a, a little bit of science to this and then, you know, there's some videos in the e-course and stuff like that. But for the most part, she wrote most of the book and people are really digging it. And I'm just super inspired. You know, and I love the feedback and everything like that. But we have to have a small little commercial timeout because we do. This is a for profit and we, the, we sell products that we literally use in our life all the time. So we have a new formula that we're super personally excited about. It's part of our life every single night when it comes to a small dessert. It's a collagen formula, optimized collagen peptides. What's unique about this, friends, is the forms of collagen peptides. There's no junk in there. These forms have been cl clinically studied by a company, uh, a German-based company that does research on collagen peptides for how they improve uh, elasticity and dermal thickness and skin thickness. There's even some good research on cellulite uh, effects and things like that. So do you want to talk a little bit about um, how we use collagen in our personal lives? And we've been using all kinds of different collagens for a long time, but we found this particular formulation to be very useful yeah. uh, as a as a dessert. Like, yeah. you know, because yeah. I think it's, it's nice to have a clean-ish type dessert that doesn't have any sugar or anything like that because right. the natural tendency if you've been fasting for, for a long time is you feel like you can afford to have junk and right. so you kind of have this sweet tooth you like you, you know we're yeah. all just human but talk to everyone that's sure. here about that so um you know you realize <clears throat> how much crab you can really put in your mouth when you're eating multiple times a day okay so one of the benefits of doing a short a much shorter feeding window is that you really have to analyze what you're taking in and the more nutrient dense your body will love you okay so even when it comes to dessert the way I think about food is a lot different, okay? So it's not like, oh, what am I craving? Now it's, 
what does my body need? And this also includes supplements, okay? So everything is very strategically planned from the moment that I break my fast with supplements to what I eat to the dessert that I prepare for my family, okay? So um, as I'm making dessert, the collagen is definitely an addition. I add whey protein. This is after I've had my main meal with the, you know, the meat or however we want to do it. Sometimes we rotate um, different proteins. Sometimes we're carnivore. Sometimes we're strict keto. Sometimes we're cyclical keto. Um, a very systematic approach to just kind of rotating things. But the dessert is another opportunity to kind of boost your protein with the whey, a clean whey, as well as the collagen. And it's delicious. It is so good. And um, I add raw cacao nibs to it. I'll use a little bit of um, like Kite Hill um, unsweetened yogurt, and I'll add some frozen cauliflower to it and mix it up. And it's super thick and filling. And um, it's just adding more benefits to the body. It's like not a Quest bar. It's not, you know, a keto packaged treat. And like those are fine in moderation if you really want. But I found that like we keep things very simple. And the less variety we have in our cupboards, the less chance of like, overeating number one because we're used to having these different things so we don't have like five different desserts to choose from or i want to try this i want to try this so that is the biggest factor that i mention in the book that kind of keeps you on track you guys is that when you do have a shorter feeding window you want your grocery list to be like absolutely you know you want to have a lot of variety with greens and season and so, and so forth but you don't want to have a lot of variety of like keto desserts or like paleo desserts or whatever because you'll think in your mind oh man, I got to have a piece of everything for dessert because I only get one chance to eat a day. And you're like, you don't want to have that temptation, okay? And so you just want enough to get excited about, but there's definitely going to be some staple foods in your nutrition, okay? So um, yeah, the collagen has been a huge staple for us and I've we love Plus it every day. Plus there's health night. benefits to it. It's satiating. Yeah. There's a lot of good research here. Mm -hmm. I mean, we love bone broth. One of my first videos on this YouTube channel back in 2014 was how to make the bone broth that we make in our family with yeah. fish heads and pig's feet and all this stuff. We still make bone broth and we cook with bone in. So the, yes. so the important thing, friends, um, you know, we have a supplement company, but you have to get your primary nutrition from real food. Yes. That's it. And if you can't afford real food, then definitely don't be buying supplements. You got to focus on real food. Right. Supplements are just that. They're supplementing, you know, just like your supplemental income. They're supplementing supplemental insurance. They're supplementing your diet. Right. And so what we found is... You know, if we don't have some small, healthy kind of treat periodically like this, and we call it a treat because it tastes good, it kind of has the same mouthfeel and flavor and texture as like an ice cream, yeah. but it doesn't have the negative effects like you're feeling guilty afterwards, like you're you're not going to overindulge this stuff. Right. Plus, the, the nice thing about making your food from scratch, like Deanna was saying, if you buy even, and we're not picking on keto cookies, keto ice cream, Deanna used to have a, a keto cookie company, right? So yeah. we're not making fun of that stuff, but we're, those products naturally lend themselves to overconsumption. Absolutely. Okay? Yeah. Because they're sitting there. They're like, oh, and then you think they're keto. So keto is healthy. If I have the keto cookie, it's healthy. Right. And that, that just by having a cookie, a granola bar, a whatever that's labeled keto, paleo, gluten-free, whatever, you're more likely to overconsume it. Right. Now, with this, we're only making a small amount. We're not making this in bulk, right? right. No. So it's, it's if okay. we want to overconsume it, we have to make more. It's like putting in the protein, putting in the collagen, putting on the but it's like a pain in the ass. So it's like, this is our little treat. This is all we're going to get as a family. That's it. And so in contrast, if there's keto ice cream or low carb ice cream or, or our favorite local ice cream from grass fed cows. And like, so you think like, oh, it's like a, it's neutral, but you, it's so easy to eat the whole darn thing. It is. And that kind of negates. Yeah. And fat bombs this. too, you guys. Like, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people that even just do the keto, um, which there's many benefits too. I noticed like they're eating fat bombs and tons of bacon. Oh, we add this tons of fat and it's like all this unnecessary stuff. Like they don't allow their body to burn its own fat and they're wondering why they're not getting results or like even putting on weight or they're constipated. And so it's, it's just really a lot of it's unnecessary and you want like, I found that like the proteins become so important. Um, and again, macros are different for everybody, but the fat was just for satiety and just to get enough in to kind of do the job, right? So um, you don't need to do all these different fat bombs. In fact, like a tiny little fat bomb, I was gonna do a post on it, is like compared to the dessert that we have, same calories. Um, the dessert that we make is very, it gives us satiety, you know? It's filling, it's fibrous. 
the fat bomb is so tiny. And like, I don't know about you, but when I eat one of those, I could eat 10 of those. I'm 120 pounds and I probably feel sick, but like they don't create satiety. And, uh, you know, there's probably a lot more benefits in the bowl of with the raw cacao and the polyphenols and a few frozen berries that are in season or fresh berries in season than this hunk of fat bomb for what? Because, you know, to look keto on paper, you just got to think about those things Mm -hmm. so that you have high ketones in your blood testing and stuff like that. You know, I think fat bombs are good if you're going on a long 24 hour run or so if we were going to go hiking who does no, no i know but very few people I, drew manning is doing this right now drew manning's oh, been on the good. podcast before um you know fit to fat to fit you know he's got a great platform and stuff like that mm-hmm. but um so like i would think and when we do have fat bombs are normally when we're in like sun valley elite athletes right when or we're if, training if you're doing like a long super high sure but most people that are eating them are not doing that right I could be wrong. No, most people are trying to lose weight (sighs) and they think that, pardon me, if they're in ketosis, that will somehow accelerate weight loss. But as we talked about with Dr. John Lemonsky and many other people that have been on our podcast up to now, ketosis, nutritional ketosis does not necessarily always equate fat loss. You can be in ketosis from just over, you know, over consuming MCT oil, butter, ghee, everything like that. That doesn't mean those ketones are being made from liberated body fat. Mm-hmm. So it's an important thing. Um, so yeah, Charlene, I'm going to get to your question here that you, it sounds like I'm going to go back and read. Charlene has a bunch of questions here. She said that no one um, usually gets to answer her questions and oh. she's leaving a bunch of things. So uh, I definitely want to get to that, but it sounds like there's a lot of context here with cancer and tumors and, and various things like that. So I want to make sure that I read these properly and I will answer you in the comment section once this video is live. Rob Bacon is in the house. Rob Bacon, you're here all the time. He wants to come over. We're manifesting. We're building a new sauna in our backyard and, and he uh, just jokingly or she said you know i'm coming over when you get that new sauna so just you know first of all i just want to say friends uh always i'm grateful that you're here uh the reason why we take time out of our day and stuff like that and and share research is because you like it and so i just want to thank you for being here really it means a lot like dan and i you know when we're lying in bed first thing in the morning, we think about like what content, what research can we synthesize and curate to help people like yourselves in your life. And uh, so we're so grateful for your support, that you subscribe to the channel, that you hit that like button and everything. Uh, and, And yes, and full disclosure, we, our livelihood is from e-courses and dietary supplements, right? So uh, you have to keep that in mind. Like we, we we do sell these things. We believe in them. We practice what we preach. If you look at our kitchen counter, we have all kinds of myoscience supplements. Uh, I'm always sending these things to my friends and family, giving them to training partners and everything like that because we believe in what we do. I just gave up my car. I, I've been a chiropractor for 20 years and I literally just left the office two weeks ago to do this full time because I'm reaching out to more people. Not that I didn't love what I did. I loved it. I did. But um, I have more time now to reach out to so many people about my true passion because I know it's going to help so many people and that it just fills my heart. So I'm so excited. So we love your feedback. And yes. if you want to be part of our membership area, there's a link below. It's a one-time charge, $27. And that gets you an ebook, other videos, live calls, and where you can ask us questions if you want more information. But of course, we share tons of free stuff too. So you don't have to do anything. But if you want to take your health and your uh, you know, education, your knowledge, and most importantly, your awareness to the next level, links are below and we have a lot of fun on these webinars we have a next one coming up here in 20 minutes and that's just for our paid members but have a lot of cool stuff we're going to share with you guys about time restricted feeding versus intermittent fasting versus omad some practical tips and takeaways and everything like that so um we'll provide our instagram accounts too i know i, I did add that oh okay because i show sure a lot of stories underneath. with yeah what we eat what organ how to cook organ meats like a lot of these different questions that people have and just give you an idea of kind of what you're getting into so Awesome. There's a few questions here uh, about the Colorado shirt. Yeah. So uh, Deanna and I met in Colorado. We both owned real estate in Colorado, worked in Colorado for, I think, nine years. Were we there for like 12, 13? 10 years. A little bit. Yeah. And we moved to the Seattle area where we are now. And Mm -hmm. that's where our pigs and chickens and daughter and dogs and everything uh, reside just outside of Seattle. 
And uh, yeah, so, so we love Colorado. Maybe one day we'll, we'll be back there. But uh, right now, the Northwest is home because uh, if you have not been to Seattle in the summer, you're totally missing out. And, uh, you know, you, you, people suffer for nine months of Seattle crappy weather just so they can experience the three good months that we do have. And we're coming up on them right now, June, July, and August. And it's great today, though. So. <laughs> Anyway, friends, as always, we're, we're talking about personal weird stuff now. You're like, dude, give me the oh man, give me the fasting stuff. So uh, we have more stuff coming up. And also be sure that you're subscribing to the channel, getting the alerts, because posting tomorrow morning is a great interview with Peter Atia. It's one of the best podcasts that we've launched so far in 2019. I think you're really going to enjoy it. And as always, thanks for being here. Thank you, guys. All right. Appreciate it. Adios, friends. 38 minutes. Wow. wow, we've been yapping away for 38 minutes. Can you believe that? All right, thanks for being here, friends. Bye. Bye.